Hi, welcome to the channel um, and welcome to the first series of the system design series for front-end engineers. Um, currently I'm preparing for front-end interview into the FANG company and uh, uh, I struggled in preparing the system design part because uh, we usually we don't have any information on the internet about the uh, system design for front-end uh, so there are lots of courses about the back-end system design but with the front-end we have some problems so I decided to make my own videos about that so this n this is not an ideal uh, content uh, and it's not a course it's actually just my thoughts and my preparation for this interview so uh, the, f the first problem which we are going to see is the Facebook newsfeed this is actually a very widespread problem for an interview and let's try to design it in like limited time frame like 15 minutes okay so uh, first we need to start with the plan of our uh, system design and the first let's just try to summarize uh, the whole stuff we are going to do so we need to start with the general requirements And the second thing to uh, to deal with is uh, some specific requirements about platforms. And uh, in our plan, there, so when, when we have all the requirements and we have the numbers, we can start thinking about componentization of our uh, feature. And this, the third point is component architecture. So the fourth point is, so each our component work with the data and we need to understand which data we use on our front-end side. So this is going to be data entities. So the next point is uh, we need to uh, fetch this data and we need an API and we want to have some fetching points inside our architecture. So uh, the five point is uh, data API so what next so we so we have our entities we have our API uh, but usually applications have the front-end storage uh, and it's important how we uh, organize the store so we are, the sixth point is the data store what about the sound point so the main feature uh, of the uh, Facebook news feed is the infinite scroll and uh, we are going to uh, see how we can implement this. So the next point is infinite scroll. Eighth point, uh, so we have the whole design but uh, we need to understand how we optimize our application for that. So eighth point is optimization and we want to our feature to be accessible to wide uh, so wide range of uh, devices and also to people with some disabilities so the eighth point we are going to see is the accessibility so we've uh, correct uh, we have all our uh, structure for the uh, system design uh, let's come up with the require uh, with the first step it's a uh, general requirements so general requirements actually is uh, uh, about the feature we want to build so we want to have the uh, infinite infinite scrollable newsfeed where sto where stories uh, appears based you know, based on the user subscriptions from the group pages uh, friends and so on so we want the user to share these stories and also to send to send uh, the data with these stories like images and links and so on so uh, user can share this story user can post the story and attach comments, links, uh, images, and videos. 
So what what else we got? Uh, so we talked about the infinite scroll and the basic features we want to have. Um, so we can go to the specific requirements. So the specific stuff, like uh, functional requirements, it's uh, about the devices and some support problems. So we we want uh, the feature to be accessible on wide on wide range devices on wide range devices. And we want uh, we want the uh, the feature to be accessible for pe for people with some disabilities. Uh, okay, uh, so we are actually done with the requirement stuff, and we can go to the next step of the it's a components architecture. So, how actually the story looks like on the f on the front end side? So basically, we have the story component which contains the avatar, title, uh, date of posting, some text and images, and uh, and control panel like like, comment, and share. Beside that, a user also can uh, post the comments down below. So we have the also we have the comment list. So this basically this is the mockup of uh, of the story, and newsfeed is actually a list of the stories. So we have multiple of them. Uh, this is our like basic components we need to have, uh, and the basic data. Like for comment list, we have avatar and text, and for the comment input, we have some actions. Uh, okay, that's cool. So we have the mockup. But uh, to understand how actually the components are organized inside the, our source code, we need to have the dependency graph, where, where we can see where, how each component depends on another. And this is also help us to understand the data flow in our application. So let's try to, uh, to, to schema this. So I've prepared already all the schemas in order to save some time, and I basically recommend you to do the same, uh, just to save time on the interview if you have, if you would have this problem. Okay. So as you can see, we have the news feed, and the news feed will contain the uh, stories component. Basically, there are lots of stories there, and the story uh, has the story card, comment list, comment input, and comment. Okay, uh, so as you can see here, uh, we can now think about the data we need to uh, have in order to render the stuff. So our next step is the data entities we need to have. So let's just say that it's actually... Uh, so I'll keep my labels here in order to understand where we have each part. So this is a component architecture. Okay, uh, let's go to the data entities part. So, uh, as you can see, uh, we need to have the uh, story data and comments and some images. So how can we describe such entity? So basically, the story. Uh, I'll use the TypeScript notation here, so don't worry about that. I feel like this is the most convenient way how can we describe the data. So, so what this, what is the story? Story has some ID, like the, the number or the string, doesn't matter. Uh, also, it has the comments, and it's actually the comment array. Uh, it also has some media, which is the media array. So media is the links, uh, video, and so and other entertainment stuff. But what else we have? Uh, also, we have the date, uh, the date of the creation, and we're going to store this as a timestamp. Um, 
Also, we have the content, which is the text user types inside. Uh, so we have the content. Uh, and story also have the user. A uh, user can be quite simple. Let's say that it's a nickname. ID Okay Oh, I'm sorry here, it's actually not the user, but the origin uh, Origin is uh, any source of the story Like the source can be the uh, uh, The source can be any type, like uh, page, group, and so on. So we have the type, uh, which is origin type. And the name. So what, I, what else we need? Uh, we have the media, date, and as you can see, we have the share ID. So I think that's enough for, for us. Um, OK. It also, we need to have some da uh, data for, for example, for user, it's a avatar, and for uh, for the group, it's actually the group, uh, the group information, and so on. So this is, I'll say this is the custom one. Okay, uh, then let's describe other entities we have. So we also have the comment. Comment have the ID. Uh, it also has the media type. It also have the uh, offer of the comment, and we'll keep this as the user ID. Uh, media is the still a media array. Uh, date is a creation date. Content is actually our content. Okay, uh, so. Okay, uh, we designed the whole uh, the uh, the whole API here. We need the type story comment. Uh, we also have the origin type, but it's not it doesn't matter actually for front end design uh, to understand the origin. Um, so we can skip it. Uh, media uh, media is just the data with the format. Let's describe it too. So what is the media? Uh, media, it's any source of the media data, and we have the limited uh, possibilities of that. So let's say that we have the type, and this can be link. It also can be a video, and so on. And also we have the URL of, uh, of that. And this is the media. Okay, so we've designed the data models we, we, we want to work with. Uh, the next step is, so we have the next step is the data API. So let's label it to, say that say uh, data models. Let's go to the data API. So what's API we need? Uh, I also uh, create the box here and try to come up with uh, all the endpoints we have. So the first one is the get post. And the get post API is pretty simple. We have the API key, which uh, provides us access to our uh, um, API. We also can have the uh, user ID in order to get stories for the user. Uh, the third point is uh, for example, we don't want to show the comments, so we can provide a blue flag like exclude the comments. Uh, the next thing is timestamp or cursor. It indicates the timestamp we need to load for data from. For example, if we loaded it for uh, two hours ago, so we want to have the data 
before that uh, cursor. So we have the cursor, but we also want to, for example, specify the page size and also uh, the maximum ID uh, we want to fetch. For example, if we have uh, the stories like number one uh, with ID 1000 and we already loaded the stories uh, uh, with the ID after 900, then we said that the max ID, uh, let's call it mean ID actually, let's say mean ID is equal to 900 and this will be our range. So we have the get boost. Uh, we also have the post, uh, create a post, which also have the epic key, user ID, and the post data. Uh, the first endpoint uh, is the create a comment, which requires us uh, for epic key, uh, user ID, and the post ID in order to indicate for which post we would like to uh, comment. So what else? It's actually this uh, the comment data. Okay, we have three points, and let's try to understand uh, how, with which protocol or technique we can uh, call this API. So we don't we don't have many possibilities, but let's describe the basic one. So API can be called with a simple REST. Uh, we can organize our API with the REST architecture, or we can go with the GraphQL approach. Uh, in the production, uh, GraphQL is very useful to use for like multi-level data because we can uh, so easily select the fields we need uh, for the client. And with it, the REST here is not that agile, and we need to create uh, several REST endpoints for that. But uh, the REST is actually very scalable because we have uh, advantages of the uh, rest uh, of the HTTP architecture, like caching technique, uh, by, which goes with the HTTP by default, and uh, with the GraphQL, because GraphQL uses the post response, uh, post requests, it doesn't work like from the box, and GraphQL manages the caches by itself. Uh, basically, we can choose any of that, and you won't be wrong here. Uh, but let's uh, let's say we want to use the rest here. Okay, uh, we described endpoints, and now so we fetched this data, but we'll, the next step we need to organize this data on the front end with uh, so with defined data models. Uh, let's let's uh, go to the next point. It's a data store. So the data store. Uh, data store. Uh, on the front, in the front-end applications, we need to have the fast access. The resources of the front-end is quite limited because the browser works uh, in a different range of devices and we want to provide the fastest access for our data. How can we efficiently organize this? So, basically, we need to define the fetching points of our uh, application, where we fetch the data and how we pass it. Uh, I'll copy the schema, component schema we had previously, and also edit the store. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, the blue rectangle, it's actually the fetching point where we fetch the post with the parameters. So we're fetching uh, the data by the cursor, like the time frame we want to have the stories. And then we push them to the, our front-end store. But how we organize the store? Store on the front end is uh, you know, we can use it in the most efficiently if we organize in a normalized flattened state. We don't have we don't want to have the multi-level like structures on the front end because uh, we don't want to uh, filter like m large arrays and so on. So uh, for that we flattening our store and normalize it by ID of the feed. So for example, if we load in the uh, feeds, then we 
save our feeds like uh, in the map structure where ID uh, refers to the feed and also the feed ID refers to the user and the media of the feed ID also refers to the media for this feed and the origin also can be accessed by the uh, by the feed ID and the comments can be accessed by the feed ID. This provides us efficient access. Uh, and let's go to the example. So we have the news feed. We pass the feed ID inside the story and then we access the store with the feed ID. So we need the feed. We access it by ID, pass this to story card. We need the comments. We access it by feed ID and pass to the comment list and so on. And the comment list have the each comment passed, uh, passed inside. As you can see here, uh, we have just one fetching point, and then we just uh, pass down the data we need and access the store directly with in efficient in efficient way. Okay, we have it. Uh, but let's think about like edge cases. Uh, do you feel like that having the one endpoint for uh, feeds is actually enough. So what if, like, okay, I will label it like edge case. So what if you are scrolling down and the store, the new stories come up? How can we load it? Uh, the problem is that if we just uh, keep on executing the get post request. It's, uh, we have the traffic overhead and we want to efficiently load, load new stories and how can we do that? So basically we have uh, load new stories. We have several approaches. One is the log polling. Uh, the second one is the web sockets. And the third one is the service side events. And which one to choose? Uh, let's describe it. Log polling is actually a technique where you ask the server for the data in, in, in like set interval, like in a constant one, like 200 milliseconds. Uh, which, what which disadvantages it have? Uh, the first. Uh, and the main one is a uh, traffic overhead. Long polling has the full it's a full request uh, with all the tokens, headers, and so on. And we don't want to actually just for like one story. We don't want to send uh, this whole overhead. Also, long polling has the longer latency uh, in the production applications, especially for mobile for, for mobile phones, which uses the network cells, but it's not a problem for this uh, newsfeed. Um, but it's, but still, it's uh, disadvantages. Um, an advantage: it's very simple technique because it's just a request we set uh, we set up with a specific interval. The next thing is the web sockets, and the web sockets is a uh, provides us a bidirectional uh, data transferring. Uh, and it's actually very fast, uh, and it's it's actually in the real time. But do we need lo to load this in the real time? I think we don't. And uh, other uh, like the major disadvantages here that web sockets do uh, do not support HTTP two protocol, and I think this is the main thing. Okay. Uh, besides the load balancing and other stuff, uh, I think that the HTTP2 is the most like important for us. And we don't need actually the real-time uh, data loading. So the third technique is uh, server-side events. What is server-side events? It's actually a very modern one thing. Uh, we subscribe for the events on the server and get updates in the binary format. It works under HTTP2 protocol and can and it's very effective. So we load only the piece we need uh, in a binary format. And yes, it's a binary format, it's not a JSON, but we can parse this binary format very easily and it's not a problem for us. But we get this piece of data without any overhead. 
also a server side event is uh, easy to load balance relatively to link polling and the web sockets of course and it doesn't have any problems of the uh, long pole in the web sockets and fully su supported by HTTP2. It has the longer latency than the web sockets, but the latency about for 60 milliseconds is fine for us. So we go, we are going to store a lot of the stories with the uh, service side events. And let's add this uh, to the endpoints we have. Not the get, but let it be for like subscribe. Okay, we actually uh, build it the uh, fix the edge cases for the API, and then I think we can go far as, uh, with our requirements. And the next thing is the infinite scroll. So what is infinite scroll? Infinite scroll. It's like you have the set of stories, uh, and you want to scroll them down indefinitely. Uh, Infinite, uh, infinitely, and the new data appeared when you uh, like go to the edges of the last stories. Um, okay, but why this? Uh, I would like to start with why this part is actually choose for uh, choose for uh, Facebook news feed. So we have the entertainment content, and in case of entertainment content, we do not need to to have the pagination or load more button. Pagination is uh, used for the data we actually want to analyze, or the table data, and the show more button. It's like the variant of the pagination, but we don't need it to because this uh, creates additional action for uh, for the user, and we want the user to stay on our website and scroll more and more. <laughs> so let's describe this feature how actually this is built on other websites. So here are the schema. So we have the stories like 10 one, uh, 10 stories and the basic approach to and this is the browser window. Like imagine that they, this whole uh, rectangle is the browser window. Uh, and this and based on the device of the user we have the different viewport. And some viewports actually can contain 12, 12 stories, 50 stories, and so on. Let's say we have the 10 stories uh, available in the viewport. Uh, when we scroll down, we need to load more stories. And for that, we need to uh, understand what we actually, we actually at the end of the page. How can we do that? In browser API, we have the intersection observer which allows us to check if the user report actually intersects with the sent, uh, with the, some HTML nodes. And for that, we use the two nodes, like top sentinel and the bottom sentinel node. Uh, top sentinel uh, works when you scroll up and you want to uh, show another piece of data which was previously showed. And the bottom sentinel works like you touch the bottom sentinel and we load more data and show it. And so what is the top padding and the bottom padding? So imagine we, the user loaded 500 stories. It's uh, actually like 500 uh, stories component and maybe 2,000 DOM elements. And why, uh, do you think this will work like fast on any device? And that's a problem we want to solve. We, don't, we want to show the constant number of nodes in order to prevent the performance issues like we have the large numbers of nodes and the performance like on the mobile phones uh, <coughs> will suffer. So, uh, the idea is to have the sliding window. So we have the data like store 100 elements and we want to show uh, only the window which user currently see on the viewport. So we have, uh, for example, in the viewport 10 stories. When we scroll down, we want to replace the stories with the new one uh, and keep uh, maintaining this number of DOM elements. And how can so? And let's describe this uh, with the picture to understand it better. 
So here it's uh, here is the schema. So you, user starts with a story one, and for example, ten is the borderline. Uh, then it actually scrolls down a little to the story ten, and this is intersection zone. Uh, this indicates when we need to load more data. Uh, so what are we are going to do? Uh, we are going to change the window which user see. So the f the story five actually became the first story on the screen, and the story uh, the story uh, fifteen is the last one. So we moved our window from one to ten to five to fifteen, and show only this number of stories. Uh, the violet zone here is the future zone which can user currently do not see, and this is the future data. So we uh, keep the, these 10 elements on the user screen, just updating their data. Uh, and this is like the main feature of the infinite scroll. By maintaining the constant number of nodes, we prevent all the performance issues here. So well, what else can we say about it? Yeah, I think... Uh, we are quite done here, so we have the top, bottom sentinel, and this is actually fine for us to describe the basic idea of that. So why do we need the top and bottom padding? Uh, when we scroll down, uh, we need to create an effect of that the user loads more data. So when we scroll down, we increase the top padding. And this creates an effect that is actually we loaded more data. And then when we scroll up, we just decrease the top body, but decrease the bottom one. And this also creates an effect that we have the uh, some data and the we keep the size of the uh, page like with uh, if this uh, if this data would be there, but it's actually not there. I feel like we can go further. So uh, let's label it too. So we have the edge cases and we have the infinite scroll design. Okay, we've designed it and the next thing is the optimization stuff. Okay, uh, let's go to the... let's think about this. So, optimization. The optimization of the websites uh, and the performance of the web website splits into several things. It's a rendering performance, or, or we start with the network performance. Rendering performance. and the uh, JavaScript performance. And let's start with the network performance. So uh, the first thing uh, we usually do is we optimize the, our assets uh, in order to load them faster. And, it, and this is uh, quite obvious, we zip the resources we have. We can go even farther and use the like the modern Chrome format for the browser, which actually support this. It's a broadly. Okay, so we have um, we have the zip, we have the Gravel one. Uh, the next thing to uh, to do with the performance is load images. So. We need to serve our images with uh, an appropriate format. So if the brow uh, and this is WebP. So if the browser supports WebP, we can serve it with the WebP. And if the browser do, do not support this, we fall back to the PNG. But this is not the end. We can also optimize the image uh, based on the viewport. Uh, how can we do that? Um, so we you know, there are several options. We can create like the images of the several sizes, but in the modern web, uh, we create the service for that. So we have the image service, uh, 
and we sent and we sent the viewport to this service and optimized images actually come up to us. Uh, and by the way, we can also cache these images inside into the caching CDN and serve this from the CDN and do not actually generate any images because usually viewports are very similar on the uh, devices and the cached images appear on the CDN uh, and also we do not want to uh, serve our content uh, to the from Australia to Europe and so on and we have the nice uh, geolocation with that, with such services okay So what else we can uh, we can uh, add here uh, with the network performance? We can also improve this by uh, switching to HTTP two. What is and why HTTP two is important? Uh, so HTTP two is a more important web protocol which enables uh, many uh, cool features like multiplexing. So multiplexing. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, the thing which solves the problem of HTTP 1. HTTP 1 had five connections uh, at max, uh, and that's why actually the pack was built. We needed to put everything in one bundle, but we do not require to do that in HTTP 2. So, uh, HTTP 2 have the multiplexing, and with that multiplexing, we can load hundreds of resources in parallel, and this optimize the performance, the network performance of the website significantly. So what uh, what else we can do here uh, to finish with the network performance? So we have the HTTP2 and this enables us uh, doing the this enables us doing the bundles plugin. So we do not uh, we do not to load uh, every data at once. We can split our application in the bundles. Like for the news feed, we can split uh, into uh, feed. Then we can also have the, for example, header, and we can also have the uh, some vendors libraries, and then we can have some analytic scripts. And with that, we can simplify the loading process, so we can load all the resources at once. And this is a cool feature. So let's go to the rendering performance. <coughs> uh, the rendering performance is one uh, one important feature we need to have. It's a uh, time to first uh, content. <coughs> we can fix it. We can decrease this time by providing uh, server-side rendering for some pages. For example, we can pre-render pre some feeds <coughs> and then and then show them. What else? Uh, we need to. We have the CSS and we have the uh, images and this uh, when the and we have the scripts. When the uh, browser like see the CSS, we want to uh, we, we do not want to block uh, the whole rendering because when the browser see the some resource, it, it loads it, and then we <coughs> render the page. So rendering performance, uh, we can inline the critical style critical styles. And also, we can align critical scripts, like uh, the first thing to build the DAO. What means inline? We can serve this inside the HTML, so we do not load any uh, data and so on. Uh, also, we can serve some, some scripts. We can serve the, some scripts with uh, correct uh, uh, loading. So, for example, we can uh, lo load scripts asynchronously so they do not block the initial render. 
or we can some use the fur keyword to not to block the whole rendering and uh, to wait for when the page is loaded and then we use some uh, scripts we will load some scripts <coughs> so JavaScript performance the JavaScript performance actually uh, pretty simple we uh, in order to improve our JavaScript we need to do less stuff yeah it's simple just do less stuff and do the stuff asynchronously and if we have some heavyweight stuff we can also cache results uh, and if we do not we don't want to block uh, the cal so the cal if the calculations with the pretty large data required we can block the whole uh, rendering uh, the whole interaction with the website we don't we don't want to, to do that but the JavaScript is a single thread language how can we overcome we can go with the uh, service workers also the web workers and cache the whole stuff uh, so and do some heavyweight job in the web worker okay so what left here so let's add to the rendering performance also uh, CSS model strategy or a class a class naming strategy what is class naming strategy it's like um, uh, BAM and uh, CSM and any uh, like the theory how we can effectively name the models so large uh, if you have multi-level CSS selectors <coughs> sorry so if you have the multi-level CSS selectors then we have the problem with the browser performance because the browser needs to pass this selector and select some elements so keeping selectors simple is uh, uh, quite good for the performance okay uh, I think we actually did a lot of job on the optimization uh, but was what else so in order to decrease uh, the re so when the user see the pages uh, and see the stories with the images uh, we can show the placeholder uh, some scientific researchers say that if you, the loads take some time and we show the uh, loader then the feeling of the time is different for the user and he and the user thinks that the image loads faster so we can show it also we can just do not render any image until actually the user uh, uh, viewport the intersects with that So this is just called that loading lazy load images. Okay, this is pretty enough here. Uh, one one more thing is that we want to have the some PVA, PVA mode. So for example, if if you go to the plane, you want to preload your stories. And then uh, see them on the plane. So we we can enable the offline uh, mode. How can we do that? It's very simple. We can use the uh, service workers with the uh, we can use the service workers with the application cache, and they can ha cache the whole resources, and we can enable all the data uh, to be accessible offline, like that. So. I will label this as a service workers. Okay, we focused on that. Uh, one last point to do is the accessibility. So, accessibility is a very broad topic to support like different screen readers and so on, but we can like enumerate the basic things. So first thing to do as the we want to support people with support uh, different 
uh, color scheme of our application. So uh, to enable a uh, user with different color blindness to use our website, What else? Uh, we want our uh, application to be accessible from the screen readers. So all inputs uh, and text areas and uh, and other elements uh, should have a real life attribute. A real life is actually which uh, when you change some content, the user screen uh, screen reader uh, voice over it. And just and dictate it to the user so the user can see the changes inside their data inputs. So images also need to have attributes, and we need to have the hotkeys. Uh, hotkeys. So which hotkeys uh, can be uh, who can be added for the newsfeed? So uh, it can be like news story hotkey. Uh, post story, uh, scroll down, and scroll top. So the five point is uh, scroll down, scroll top, mm, and call for help with all like uh, hotkeys. And the sixth one, uh, return to main menu, which enables like uh, to see like, like the quick access for the main menu. Also, sharing options. Okay, we've supported the accessibility stuff, and I feel like we did a great job here. So we dis we discussed each point, like the components architecture, data models, API, uh, also data store, edge cases, infinite scroll, optimization, and accessibility. Uh, and I feel like this uh, we are done here. So thanks for watching this video. I will provide you with this schema in attachments to this video to this video. So have a good day and have a good JavaScript. Uh, bye and see you in the next videos. Oh, by the way, uh, comment. Please kind of leave the comments and we can make the content better together. If you. Uh, provide, provide me with your opinion and how can we actually improve the whole 